Hi, welcome. Today we're going to talk about 24 ways to improve memory and class performance. The first rule, it's a little condescending to even say this, but it's the most important aspect of making new memories and doing well in school is to pay attention. Now it's easier said than done sometimes. Many times we want to pay attention, but other things grab our attention. So let's explore some of the negative impacts upon attention. All of these factors have an impact on our attention, therefore our short-term memory, and therefore our ability to encode or make new long-term memories. The first one is stress. We have to watch out for stress. Stress almost always impairs cognitive functioning and memory performance. It does it through a couple of different pathways. In the short term, stress can occupy your short-term or working memory, or what's on your mind. For instance, right now, if you're just getting settled into this lecture and you're still thinking about something stressful, something maybe that you need to deal with after this lecture, then that's going to impair your ability to pay attention to what I'm saying right now. So it's important to try to get the stressful things off of your mind. Secondarily, stress has a negative impact over the long haul. Stress releases a hormone called cortisol, and cortisol impairs memory functioning. It does a lot of other bad things too. It impairs your immune functioning, causes you to retain weight around the midsection, uh, damages your cells, shortens your cells' life expectancy, but it also affects our ability to make new memories. So right away, stress is one of the biggest impacts on our attention and our memory ability. If we go back to the list, some of the other factors include sleep deprivation. We always have to watch out. Whenever one is sleep deprived, their memory ability decreases regardless of age and anything else going on. And actually, a couple or a few nights without good sleep, two to three hours sleep at night, the person will begin to become amnesic and have difficulty making new long-term memories from the day before. Another factor that really deserves some attention is music with words. Now, music alone, if it doesn't have words, as far as I know, it has no impact, negative impact on attention and memory. But research has shown that music with words, or frankly any words, get access to your short-term working memory. Therefore, you have less space left over, fewer cognitive resources left over to make a new memory. What happens is, it's called the speech unattended effect, or the unattended speech effect, which means speech that you're not paying attention to gets automatic access to your short-term memory. And so if you are listening to music, while well, trying to read a challenging text, for example, you actually have less short-term memory. Now recall, short-term memory, or the capacity of our short-term memory, is an important aspect of intelligence. Maybe a quarter of our IQ scores are determined by our short-term memory capacity. Therefore, if you're listening to music with words while trying to learn something new, particularly something challenging, then it's going to reduce that short-term memory capacity, which is essentially reducing your intelligence. And you very easily could take somebody you know, 20 points lower in their IQ if they're listening to music with words. So a lot of people report that it helps them relax, to pay attention, uh, but the research shows that it has a negative impact. Now, with that said, I have to admit, I wonder if the current generation of college students who've grown up with uh, iPods all their life, um, they had these things that when, when I was a teenager were invented called Walkman, um, just big little uh, cassette players that uh, would play tapes. But all of your life, uh, if you're a traditional college student, you've had access to MP3 players or other music players. It's possible that the brain develops differently if this happens at a young age. Uh, but as far as I know, as of right now, no research has shown that the current generation of college students are immune from the unattended speech effect. So reduce that. Back to the list, similarly, people talking. Uh, just when you're around anybody talking, even if you're not trying to pay attention, even if it's quiet, even if it's in a foreign language, it still gains access to your short-term memory. Well, I think language is so important for human beings that we uh, give preference to that over many other stimuli, particularly uh, if the, uh, the language is more interesting. So consequently, television. I hope you're not studying with the television on. If you are, stop. Uh, that's, uh, that's not a good thing to do. Uh, lack of concentration, exhaustion, low blood sugar levels. You have to watch out for that. 
many people know when they have low blood sugar levels and they'll do something about it, but do be careful. You know, if your blood sugar levels get low, you're going to have a harder time paying attention. This could be problematic uh, for somebody who has blood sugar level problems like uh, hypoglycemia or diabetes. Caffeine withdrawal. If you generally drink caffeine in the evening, for example, uh, or in the afternoon, then in the morning there could be caffeine withdrawal. Or if you decide to, to go off the caffeine for a while, uh, stop drinking coffee, for a short period of time until your body adjusts, you actually will have impaired ability to pay attention and make a new memory. And then lack of mental practice. Over time, we can enhance our ability to pay attention, but after a summer vacation, that lack of mental practice can affect it. So, watch out for attention. The first rule in making new memories is to pay attention. It's uh, very important, and we see it across the lifespan. Young children have a hard time with that. Attention deficit disordered children have a hard time with that. Attention deficit disordered adults have a hard time with that. And then later in the lifespan, when mild cognitive impairment or early stage of dementia come in, once again, attention is problematic, and that's driving many of the memory impairments. Number two of the 24 ways to improve memory. Whenever possible, try to encode information in more than one way. You don't want to just re and make the memory that has just one pathway to it. Try to encode the memory in more than one way. Try to think of a, a mnemonic or a memory trick that can help you remember it. A rhyme can help, that help you remember it. A visual image that can help you remember it. Even writing it down and looking at how it was written down uh, is encoding it in a different way. Uh, so whenever possible, try to think of another way to view the information you're trying to remember, another perspective to take on that, uh, an example of that in use. Whenever you can add something to the basic information you're trying to remember, it's going to dramatically enhance your ability to remember that over the long haul. Number three, related to that, try to use visual imagery. Whenever possible, try to create a visual image of what you're trying to remember. Sometimes it can be fanciful, sometimes it can be uh, whimsical, but try to create uh, some sort of visual imagery. When I was in graduate school, I had to take a lot of microbiology, clinical neuroscience type classes, and a lot of that stuff was just straight rote memorization that really wasn't connected to much else that, that we knew at the time, you know, as students. So it was difficult to encode the information in more than one way because it was just a simple fact that needed to be recalled. But I would try to draw on my flashcards. I always use flashcards for classes like that. And I'd try to draw pictures um, of the concept, just a little cartoon of the concept. And whenever I did that, I would think about it on the time of the exam. And if I had made a picture, it was very rare that that information um, was forgotten at the time of the exam. I almost always got those questions right. I would think of the image. Uh, I spent so much time trying to think of the image, drawing the image, that it allowed me to lay down a memory. So that can be effective, particularly if you're having a hard time connecting it to other things that you know. Number four, some of these suggestions I'm giving you are more powerful than others, and this is one of the more powerful ones. Take your time. This is of paramount importance. You know, I think this is one of the biggest problems that freshmen and sophomores have, is they think that they can learn, particularly textbook material, a lot faster than they can. One problem is that cramming is inefficient. And, and many college students have busy schedules, busy lifestyles. They might only have a couple of days a week that they really can devote to studying. That is not a good situation because they're going to try to cram all that learning into, say, two days. We just don't learn well that way. Most students cannot effectively study and learn new material for more than two to three hours at a time. And, and that's kind of the maximum. Uh, you know, a freshman or sophomore, uh, junior or senior for that matter, coming in off a of summer vacation, uh, really it's probably going to be much less than two hours. You'll notice over the course of the academic year that that does go up. Even in the course of a quarter or semester, that does go up. Uh, but even the best of us, two to three hours maximum, and then you're going to be exhausted. Monitor yourself, and I'm going to have some suggestions as to how you can monitor yourself, monitor your fatigue, monitor your ability to make new memories. When you can't do that anymore, it's time to do something else. Another suggestion is to stay organized, and in that context, we'll talk about that more later, but in that context, it's important to stay organized, have a list of things that you need to do. So when you reach that point, maybe two hours after you start studying, start reading textbook chapters, 
that you have something else to do. Go print out those PowerPoint slides. Go get that book. Go send that email. Uh, whatever it is, the simple little things you need to do that don't require a lot of attention, uh, that you can do after your brain is fatigued, after your mind is fatigued, those are nice to have, particularly if you're uh, carving out more than two to three hours at a time to study. Back to take your time. Your brain's tolerance for the lengthy study sessions will increase throughout the year, so factor that in. Another suggestion is to try to study two hours every day at a specific time and place. I know not everybody has the luxury in their schedule to do that, but that is extremely effective. If you have the flexibility in your schedule where every evening you can study from 7 to 9 in the same place, you will become much more efficient. It's as if your body becomes prepared to study at that time of day. And then you go to that place, and that place provides a context a context where you have studied like that before, and a context that will facilitate learning and attention, uh, the ability to have sustained attention over time. Many of these were suggestions were given to me by my mentor, who was one of the nation's leading experts in memory. And I started trying these suggestions around my junior year, and after that, it was almost straight A's. Uh, before that, it wasn't straight A's, and, uh, and I attribute this one, trying to study two hours every day at a specific time and place, to him. It really was effective. That was my place in the third floor of the library uh, where I studied um, two hours every day, same time and place. Uh, wonderful strategy. Related to that, you need to find a quiet place to study. Related to the idea that uh, people talking, television, other verbal noise gets to automatic access to short-term memory. Any successful scholar, any successful student needs to find their place that's quiet. Now, the library is always a good place. Here at Western Oregon University, the different floors of the library provide different environments in terms of quietness and thus appropriateness for study. The first floor is relatively social, not particularly conducive for, say, textbook readings. There's currently no rules regarding talking, um, talking on your cell phones, for example, uh, on the first floor of Hammersley Library. That's a great place to check your email, a great place to print off articles, a great place to do things, particularly if you're going to need help from the librarians and other staff there, but not a good place for, say, textbook reading. The second floor is quieter, but still somewhat social. That's where most of the study rooms are located. It's another option. You can just schedule study rooms. They're very easily scheduled. Uh, there isn't uh, too much demand until we kind of get to the 8th, ninth, 10th week of the quarter. Uh, the first part of the quarter, you almost can just walk in and get one. But just go online, reserve a study room, and that can be a fabulous way to study. There may be some advantages to studying within groups, um, but it's not something that I would recommend doing. Most of the time that I witness students studying in groups, they're not nearly as efficient. Uh, they're, it's a case where some people are coming unprepared, people are prepared or teaching them. little benefit for that, uh, but it's not really an efficient way to study. Now, if you have unlimited time uh, to spend studying and you just want a different perspective, the study groups might be helpful. Or if you're working on a project, certainly the study groups are appropriate for that. But when the learning is kind of supposed to be, you know, reviewing the lecture material, um, learning the textbook material, which is very time consuming, if that's primarily what the class is about, the study groups aren't going to be very helpful in my opinion. The third floor of Hammersley Library, this is the quiet floor. There's relatively few study rooms that would be appropriate for group, group work, um, but that is the quiet floor. If you need to be just out on a table, sitting in one of the comfortable chairs, that's probably the place you want to be doing it. 